Good morning. It's my pleasure uh, to be the uh, chair and moderator of the next session. The next session's uh, subject matter is on the environment. So what we'll be hearing in this session, which will start now, it'll involve five different lectures. It will uh, continue, it'll, there'll be three in the morning before lunch, there'll be a, another two after lunch. Um, so in this session, we're going to see what's actually happening or get some glimpses of what's actually happening. Uh, Ralph did an excellent job of showing us the data that demonstrates that things are different now and they're continuing to change. What we'll talk about in this um, session is how this is affecting the, the earth, humankind, other life on the earth, uh, plant life, other aspects of, uh, of society and the workings of the surface sort of parts of the planet. So we'll start out with a keynote address from Chris Field. Now Chris is uh, distinguished at the moment as the uh, founding director of Carnegie Institution's Department of Global Ecology. This Carnegie Institution is on the campus of Stanford University, and Chris is also a professor of biology and environmental earth system science at Stanford. He also has the responsibility to co-chair the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC's Working Group 2, which uh, is involved with uh, updating our knowledge of impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability uh, to climate change. So his talk will give us an overview of what we're dealing with uh, due to the rapidity uh, with which climate change is happening. Now following that, I have to warn you that we've changed the schedule slightly and the order of the talks will be a little bit different. The next talk will be by, uh, at, it'll start at 11.50, or actually we're comfortably behind time at the moment, so it might be a little bit later than that. Uh, and it will be by Bill Collins. Uh, Bill is the uh, head of the climate science department in the Earth Sciences Division up at the Berkeley Lab and is also affiliated with Earth and Planetary Science Department at the, on the UC Berkeley campus. And he's going to talk to us about um, advances in simulating how climate works. And the advances in simulation, of course, are to help us understand what's going to happen in the future. And he'll give us an update on how, what's happening with regard to the science of, of simulating the Earth's climate and predicting how it will change. Now that then will be followed by uh, a talk by Charles Marshall. Um, Charles is the director of the University of California's Museum of Paleontology. So you're switching from the view by a climate scientist who's trying to understand largely the atmosphere and its coupling to the ocean and the biosphere. And then we'll look at a paleontologist's view who looks at the past of how life has changed on the Earth due to past climate changes and tries to make some uh, predictions and guesses, really, about what might be happening in the near future. So that will take us through uh, lunch. And then following lunch, we've got uh, two other kinds of talks, one by Berent Smit. Now, Berent is, um, is a professor of chemistry and chemical and biomolecular engineering at UC Berkeley. And he's going to explain to us a little bit about one thing we could do which is try to prevent CO2 that's coming from uh, coal-fired and gas-fired power plants from reaching the atmosphere by capturing it in smokestacks and then putting it somewhere. And the only place we can think of to put it at the moment is underground because it's the, the biggest reservoir we have that's not too far away. He'll explain some of that and then we'll finish up with Inez Fung, who's also a distinguished professor at the, uh, on the campus of UC Berkeley and has been studying uh, atmospheric science and the effects of climate change for many years. And she'll be talking to us about uh, what happens when we want to uh, keep track of what countries, different countries are doing with regard to emitting carbon to the atmosphere. How well could we do that? Could we police treaties and, um, and uh, agreements about the value and uh, penalties for, clim for carbon uh, emissions to the atmosphere? So that's a kind of overview of what we're going to be looking at over the next five talks. After we won't make another break now until just before lunch. Uh, so we'll hear talks by Chris Field, uh, then by uh, Bill Collins, and, and then by Charles Marshall. And at that point, we'll take questions for about 10 or 15 minutes, and hopefully our stomachs won't be growling. I know mine will. Uh, and then we'll break for lunch, and we'll come back for the final two talks in the afternoon. I'm sorry I took talk as long as I did for that, but uh, let me now introduce Chris Field, uh, who will give the plenary presentation entitled The Velocity of Climate Change. Get a microphone. 
Thanks, Don. And let me start by congratulating Graham and Don and the entire Berkeley community for pulling together a fantastic program. I also want to start by uh, thanking Ralph for laying out the issues about amount of climate change. What I'd like to do is take a slightly different cut on the topic and talk about pace. And in particular, I want to talk about pace in uh, four different uh, juxtaposing contexts. Uh, talk about the pace at which climate's changing. Talk about the pace at which impacts are accumulating. But then I want to also talk about two important components of the human aspects of the system. The first is the pace at which our understanding of the mechanisms and the consequences is, is developing. And then finally, I want to talk about the pace at which human responses is progressing and how that compares with the pace that would be necessary in order to um, arrive at a, a level of climate change that's essentially protective of the environment. Uh, my goal as a researcher is to communicate as much through my career as uh, Tom Tolles communicates in this cartoon. Uh, the, the, the theme here is that in 2060, uh, the search for a breakthrough technology to solve climate change continues. And, and, and what is it in, in 2060? Uh, it's a time machine. It'll take us back 50 years when we should have put a price on carbon. And you know, if there's a, if there's a single message in the material I want to present today, it's that uh, we already know enough to start making smart decisions. And the real challenge we need to go uh, to progress through is how we go from uh, a, an atmosphere where we're sort of consumed with doubt uh, to one where we can make smart decisions. I don't want to lay out the components of that. The, the kind of marching orders that the world is working under now with respect to action on climate change was laid out in the UN Framework Convention. 1992, and, and it has two important components. It has an amount component and a rate component. Uh, the amount component is that our goal as stewards of the planet is to uh, prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Uh, we've been thinking that this might represent some kind of a bright line, a threshold, where as long as we're below that threshold, we're safe. Once we're above that threshold, we're not safe and we've somehow failed. Uh, one of the messages that I want to communicate is that the idea of a threshold isn't really the most useful way to understand this problem. Uh, there, there are individuals and places in the world that have probably already passed the threshold of dangerous anthropogenic interference. There are other places that have benefited from the climate changes that have occurred so far. And, and as we look at the future, what we're really trying to do is figure out a way to manage a risk profile that alters as the climate changes. Uh, the second important component of Article 2 of the UNFCCC is this rate component. And uh, the, the article says, we need to act within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally, to ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. I, I'm going to talk about, about um, the ecosystem impacts a little bit, and, and the sustainable development. The sustainable development is a, is a two-edged sword. Uh, if we want to allow sustainable development to proceed in a, in a sustainable manner, uh, we need to make sure that we don't invest so much in climate change that we pull money away from economic development. But we also want to make sure that we don't let the climate deteriorate to such an extent that sustainable development is no longer possible. And the real challenge is how we figure out how to walk that tightrope. <laughs> Probably the most important concept that I want to communicate today is that when we think about climate change impacts, we're really thinking about managing a risk profile. And for people who are disaster managers, the, the idea of risk is that it's a product of the uh, probability of an event and the consequence. Uh, so in terms of a rational approach to risk, there is great risk associated with high probability events, even if they're of only moderate consequence. But there's also great risk associated with low probability events if they're of very, very high consequence. And we want to we um, organize our approach to the problem so that we acknowledge the full spectrum across this risk profile. Uh, there are at least uh, three kinds of analogies that that are widely used to describe climate. I, I, I'm going to introduce a, a new one. Um, my colleague, Steve Schneider, who tragically died in July, often 
use the, uh, the analogy of, of climate change as being like uh, playing a game with, with loaded dice. And the more the climate changes, the, the more the probability we're loading the dice toward uh, unfavorable outcomes. John Holdren, the president's science advisor, often uses the analogy that, that climate change is like uh, driving a car along a highway, or well, maybe along a highway, maybe not, but where there's a cliff someplace, and we're in the fog, it's dark, our headlights don't work very well, and we don't really know uh, what to do in order to avoid that cliff. I, I want to introduce a new analogy that I'm going to extend in a couple of important ways, and it's one that speaks to me uh, about the full dimensions of the climate problem. And, and I think that we live in a world where uh, our economic activities are, are basically like a truck that's driving along the road of life, and it's doing all the things it's doing to produce uh, the lifestyles that people aspire to, uh, but it's also dumping nails along the highway of life. And uh, there were lots of reasons when this uh, truck of the global economy got going that people didn't worry too much about these nails accumulating on the road. But uh, now, as we're following along, the, these nails represent a real problem. Um, for, for some drivers, it, it may mean the occasional flat tire and inconvenience, expense of doing a repair. Uh, for some drivers, it may mean a, a serious or a catastrophic accident. And, and the more nails there are, the more probability there is of a, of a truly catastrophic multi-car pileup. And in fact, if, if, even if we're in a super good vehicle that's totally immune to, to nail punctures, if there's a massive pileup ahead of us, uh, we could run into severe problems. And, and part of the reason I like this uh, dumping nails on the highway of life analogy is that, is that it speaks to kind of the full set of uh, solutions that we ought to be considering. Uh, when we look at mitigation options, uh, either improving efficiency or bringing new technologies online. We're essentially talking about decreasing the rate at which we dump the nails on the highway. Uh, there's a lot of new information about the permanence of climate change, that those nails don't go away by themselves. Uh, it, another thing that we could do to, to deal with all these nails on the highway of life is we could, uh, we could buy a super vehicle with multi-steel belted tires and, uh, and, and be immune from the nails. And if we had the resources and the technology to do that, we could ad adapt effectively. Uh, but for those uh, fellow humans who, who don't have that, that kind of capital resources, or for the non-human uh, organisms we share the Earth with, uh, if they don't have that capacity, uh, the opportunities for adaptation aren't necessarily accessible to them. A, a, a final set of technologies that are being increasingly widely discussed are the geoengineering or radiation management technologies that Graham asked about earlier. And I, I think of those as kind of uh, putting a piece of paper over these nails on the highway of life. They may mean that the first couple of cars get over the nails without uh, having any, any damage from them. But, but the nails are still there, and successive cars are going to have to deal with them. As I said, I, I want to uh, talk about a bunch of aspects of velocity that interact in interesting, important ways. Uh, the first, how fast the climate's changing. And uh, Ralph already introduced some important components of that theme, so I, I won't spend much time on it. I, I want to say a few things about the history of our understanding of climate. It's really uh, remarkable how insightful some of the early researchers were in this area and how the uh, fine-tuning that we've done in recent years has, has really uh, validated and verified some of the very early conclusions. I, I want to talk a, a little bit about um, how the pace of climate change translates into, uh, into the needs for responses in society and in ecosystems. And I, and I want to talk about kind of three aspects of, of, of where we're headed. The, um, the, the climate system and human systems both have a tremendous amount of inertia in them. And I think that we're increasingly moving into an environment where, where it's this inertia uh, more than the amount of changes that we've already experienced that set constraints on what our options are now and moving into the future. And then finally, I want to close with a couple of comments on, on the pace of the human responses to date. Uh, Ralph already talked about this figure. I think everybody's heard that the uh, last 12 months have been the hottest 12 months in the instrumental record. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that the um, warming of the climate system has occurred. The IPCC said warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And um, there are some indications that the, that the pace is increasing. Um, 
yeah, here's a projection of, um, of where we might end up if uh, the world follows a, the, the set of kind of consistent uh, economic and development trajectories that were characterized in the, uh, in the 2007 IPCC report. And, and there are really two important themes of, uh, of how the world might develop. The first is that uh, what we do in the future makes a huge difference. This is warming over the 21st century, and if we proceed with a business as usual high emissions scenario, we end up with a large amount of warming, with a large amount of uncertainty around it. Uh, if we have a much lower emission scenario, we end up with a much smaller amount of warming, a smaller amount of, of damages. But it's really striking that uh, there's still a, a tremendous amount of uncertainty in where we might end up. And research is, is narrowing that uncertainty, but there are a lot of reasons to think that the narrowing is going to be slow relative to the need of the pace at which decisions need to be taken. And even if you look at some of these low emission scenarios like B1 or A1T, what you see is a, a very wide range between the a low end and the high end of the possible temperatures and as a consequence the, the possible impacts. And I think what, what that range says to me is that there's a tremendous need for uh, research and deployment of adaptation strategies, strategies for coping with the climate changes that can't be avoided. At the same time, there's a, a, a huge benefit in terms of the end of century temperatures in transitioning from a high emissions trajectory to a to a low emissions trajectory. Yeah, I want to say just a couple of things about uh, climate change impacts and how we might think about them in the context of, of risk. Uh, there, there are a bunch of uh, different kinds of measures of ways to think about risk. Here's one from a, a recent National Research Council study on climate stabilization targets. And, and it illustrates what I think of as a exquisite and in some ways terrifying sensitivity of, of some parts of the Earth's system to even moderate changes in temperature. Uh, this is a map of the uh, projected, oh, no, I'm sorry, not the projected, the, the uh, observed increase in the area burned annually for each one degree increase in temperature uh, in the western United States. And, and what you can see is that in many areas of the west, there is a more than 200, even more than 300 or 400 percent increase in the area consumed in wildfires for each one degree C warming. The, the uh, sensitivity here is so great that it doesn't take very much warming in order to uh, push areas that were fundamentally safe into, into areas that were fundamentally uh, not acceptable as a, as a place to live. Uh, wildfire is a, is a wonderful example, too, of the complexity of climate impacts because we know that one contributor to wildfires is uh, consequences of past suppression. Uh, we know another controller of the damages from wildfire is, is uh, where we build infrastructure. But it also is really clear from this analysis that changes in climate are a, a major controller in uh, the, the risk of wildfire. And I think this sensitivity provides a very strong motivation for thinking hard about avoiding the catastrophic risk, the lower probability, very high consequence events. I, I want to sort of present a, another way to think about risks. Uh, this is a, a map of Europe during 2003 and the, the bullseye over uh, over central France here is, shows the, uh, the profoundly warm 2003 heat wave. Uh, the, the bottom figure here shows uh, the, all the historical temperature records for, um, for central Europe uh, that are available from the instrumental record. And you can see that 2003 is, is a big outlier. If you were trying to set up a societal response to expected temperatures, you, you probably wouldn't be based on the historical temperature records, investing very much in temperatures that were as big outliers as the 2003 conditions were. But then if we put 2003 in the context of the projected end of century conditions, we get a much different picture. And what you can see is that the, the uh, projected end of century temperatures end up with these 2003 conditions, uh, a heat wave that resulted in what's estimated to be around 30,000 excess deaths. Uh, right at the peak of the, uh, of the uh, probability density function. And there we've transitioned from what currently would look like a, um, 
very low probability event, one that was so low probability that we might not want to invest in it, to uh, one that would be extremely common and would obviously warrant a, a significant investment. Uh, one other important feature of this, of this risk analysis is that it, it illustrates the challenge of um, attributing any given weather or climate event to climate change. As of 2003, we could say that, well, there was a, an exceedingly low probability that uh, this was a sample from this distribution, and that suggests that maybe anthropogenic climate change played a role, but we can't be sure. And that's probably the most important bottom line from this kind of risk analysis approach, is that, that we can never be 100% sure that we can un uh, questionably attribute a single climate or weather event to climate change, but that doesn't necessarily need to be a motivation for not being able to make smart decisions. Talk a little bit, shift gears, and talk about the, the history of our understanding of climate change. This is the, uh, the, the title page of uh, 19, 1896, more than 100 years ago, a paper by the brilliant Swedish chemist uh, Arrhenius. And, um, he, he was exploring the consequences of, of doubling atmospheric CO2 for climate. And it was really striking how much Arrhenius knew. Uh, Arrhenius knew that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. He knew in pretty accurate terms how much infrared radiation it absorbs. And he knew some extremely important things about the way the Earth system functions. For example, he knew that if you have a warmer atmosphere, there would be more water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas as well and would amplify whatever the CO2 effect was. Uh, Arrhenius also knew that if you put more CO2 in the atmosphere, that uh, some of it would dissolve in the oceans and you would end up with an eventual partitioning where you had something like 80% of the CO2 in the oceans and 20% and in the atmosphere. And, and based on the things that were, that were known in 1896, you know, known and not contested since then, known to the uh, level of uh, certainty that, for example, we know how a transistor or electric motor works, uh, Arrhenius concluded that we would expect to see a doubling of atmospheric CO2 uh, lead to a warming at the global scale of something like 2 to 5 C. Uh, there, were some, there were some errors in the, in the analysis Arrhenius made, but it's important to recognize that we fundamentally knew enough in 1896 to come up with a pretty realistic estimate of uh, what the climate changes from a doubling of atmospheric CO2 might be. The, the big number that Arrhenius didn't have a good handle on is the climate sensitivity. Uh, what kind of feedbacks are there that, that either upregulate or downregulate the climate change from a CO2 doubling? And uh, there, that's still an area of very active research, and there is much to be learned, and, and a lot of uncertainty that's, that uh, is associated with the, with the current state of the art. The, the green triangles here uh, represent the model climate sensitivity, how much warming we get at equilibrium from a doubling of atmospheric CO2 from all the models in the last IPCC report. You can see that number goes from uh, around two to a little more than, than um, four degrees with an IPCC most likely value of about three. Uh, what the IPCC concluded in, a, in a, a rather terrifying way is that higher values of the climate sensitivity cannot be excluded. The, these climate sensitivities are more or less validated against the ice core records that Ralph already showed. Uh, but one of the things that hadn't been done until the work of uh, Carolyn Snyder, a graduate student who just finished with Steve Schneider, uh, was that all of the climate proxies from the paleo record hadn't been utilized. And when Carolyn assembled the information from all of the climate proxies, what she found was that you could draw um, a much uh, higher confidence probability density function uh, shown in black here of the climate sensitivity from the historical record. Uh, she also concluded that the climate sensitivity seemed to be uh, lower in cooler periods and higher in warmer periods. But the fallout of this analysis is that the revised best estimate from this uh, comprehensive set of paleo proxies is now about 4C rather than the best estimate from the IPCC of 3C meaning that if this stands up to further evaluation, we need to ratchet up our expectations of the amount of warming we'll see uh, by something like a third. Uh, and you know, it's not uh, really the case that, that uh, sophisticated, comprehensive understanding of the consequences of climate change has only emerged in the last few years. If you look back uh, through the history of the topic, there were uh, a lot of brilliant people who basically 
uh, had the story right. Uh, even back in the 1960s, in February of 1965, Lyndon Johnson gave a speech, said, you know, a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels uh, based on the pioneering research of Dave Keeling. Uh, the, the very, very important 1979 Charney report to the National Academy of Sciences uh, said both that uh, we, we find no reason to doubt that climate change is a result and no reason to believe that these changes will be negligible. You know, most people felt, well, not most people, some people felt, Charney, I think, felt that there was enough information that was available in the late 1970s to start taking smart actions, not necessarily aggressive actions, but smart actions to uh, position ourselves to minimize the amount of climate change that occurs and to cope with the kinds of changes that were unavoidable. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the pace of the responses in, in ecosystems. You know, we know a lot about current patterns of, uh, of temperature gradients around the world, and we have increasingly useful projections of, uh, of how temperatures might change in the future. We usually think of the, of the velocity of climate changes in terms of uh, degrees per decade or degrees per century, uh, but there's no reason that we can't think of the velocity of climate change as a, a velocity on the ground uh, in terms of uh, kilometers per year. And in fact, if we take the uh, quotient of the degrees per year and, and degrees per kilometer, we end up with a velocity of climate change. And, and that's what's plotted here from a, a paper by uh, Scott Laurie and others that appeared in Nature last year. And what you can see is that there are uh, large parts of the world where the, the velocity of climate change, the, the red areas here, is, is greater than a kilometer per year. Uh, you can think of that as that's the distance that a, a plant or animal or person would have to move in order to stay in a climate zone that was uh, had a stationary climate through time, uh, a dynamic geography in a stationary climate. Uh, if we think about the history, what we know is that as the Earth come out of uh, past ice ages, we've seen ecosystems move by up to speeds of about a tenth of a kilometer per year. So we know that, that uh, with a lot of disruption, uh, ecosystem movements at, at that scale are at least not impossible. The average at the global scale for the uh, projections with a kind of a middle of the road A1B scenario is, is 0.42 kilometers per year from this analysis from Lori and others. And um, just over 30% of the world has velocities of climate change that are, that are more than one kilometer per year. Uh, the, the, the global mean, this 0.42 kilometers per year, is just about a, a yard per day. And it's kind of scary to think about that for uh, a redwood tree to, to keep up with climate change, uh, in principle, it should be moving a meter north or a meter upslope per day. There have, been, uh, there have been a lot of studies that have said, well, can plants and animals keep up? Uh, the, the, probably the m most uh, comprehensive one was by Camille Parmesan and Gary Yeo in 2003. And they looked at, a, at several hundred examples of uh, shifts in, in where species occurred or in uh, what time of the year they did things. And they found that the average shift uh, was 0.61 kilometers per year, uh, very close to this 0.42 kilometers per year that, that we find is the average change. And is this good news or is it bad news? And I think it's really important to look at the uh, context and at the ecosystems in order to get a feel for that. Uh, one of the species that uh, Parmesan and Yo found was moving was the checker spot butterfly. There are lots of examples now showing that uh, butterflies tend to be among the organisms that are best at moving. Uh, not as good, however, as lots of weeds. And uh, one of the lines of evidence that's coming consistently from the new research is that the plants and animals that are best at moving around and taking advantage of the opportunities that are created by climate change tend to be the, the weediest and most noxious species like this yellow star thistle, which now, uh, by some accounts, including mine, ruins about a quarter of California's grasslands. Uh, another unexpected thing we're seeing in terms of ecosystem responses is, is large-scale regional die-off of many different kinds of species. Uh, here's a, a plot of a, a dead aspen stand in Colorado. Sudden aspen decline has influenced um, many 
tens of thousands of square miles in Colorado, and we've seen large-scale die-offs of forest species in the southwest with pinyon pine um, and in British Columbia with pine bark beetle. And I think that to a very unexpected extent, what we're seeing is that in particular places and particular ecosystems, a threshold gets hit and you see a large-scale die-off. On the other hand, I think there are other kinds of species, and the sequoia redwood is probably a good example where you know, we can't really tell whether this ecosystem uh, is, is still in its uh, acceptable climate zone, or maybe it left it hundreds of years ago when what we're looking at is a museum ecosystem that's, that's slowly degrading. And I think this diversity of ecosystem responses is actually the, uh, the, the framework in which we need to think about the future. Uh, an important uh, element to keep in mind when we talk about where we're headed with, with climate change is to uh, frame whether or not the climate changes that we're experiencing now uh, go away after a few centuries or essentially permanent. And we know that, that eventually the CO2 that's released the atmosphere, most of it gets taken up by the oceans. And until a couple years ago, people had thought, well, and we'll probably return to the pre-climate change temperatures uh, as the, the CO2 concentration goes away. In, in this um, figure from Matthews and Caldera, and there have now been a bunch of papers that have showed essentially the same thing. Uh, they simulated a pulse of a huge amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and then that pulse decays away as the CO2 is taken up by the oceans. Uh, this is a, a plot for 2,000 to 2,500, 500 years. And the striking result from uh, Matthews and Caldera is that the, the warming didn't go away. It, it persists is essentially unchanged through this whole period, even though the CO2 concentration is gradually dropping as the CO2 is taken up by the oceans. And the interpretation here is that what's happening is that even though as the CO2 concentration goes down, uh, less and less extra heat is being trapped by the atmosphere. As the ocean temperatures adjust, the oceans are getting to be less and less good at taking up this extra heat. And so you end up with what essentially turns out to be permanent climate change. So as we think about a strategy for responses, it's important to recognize we're not looking at um, consequences of, of a century or two or ele of elevated temperatures, but at least as far as the recent research is indicating, uh, many centuries or millennia at, at which the climate change is essentially fixed unless we can figure out some additional way to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, the, the inertia in the system is really dramatic. This is a, a wonderful picture of Hoover Dam by Ansel Adams. I wanted to, to get a picture of, um, of a coal-fired power plant, but Ansel Adams didn't take any pictures of coal-fired power plants. And uh, the reason I want to talk about infrastructure is that um, uh, Hoover Dam was, was completed in 1936. Well, we're still using it after uh, uh, more than 80 years. And, when we think about setting up an energy infrastructure for the, the rest of the 21st century, we need to recognize that infrastructure lasts a long time. We're now building the energy infrastructure that we're going to be using in 2040, 2050, 2060. And if we don't do it right, we're going to be stuck with it for a long time. And the costs of retirement are what's going to drive the costs of uh, effectively responding to climate change. So, uh, beautiful paper in Science just a few weeks ago by Steve Davis and colleagues that said, well, what are the emissions that we're committed to as a consequence of the fact that this infrastructure hangs out for a long time? And in the left-hand panel, you can see that, that um, most of the emissions we're committed to are from the uh, primary energy generation. Uh, some are from, from uh, transportation. But what I think is really especially interesting and important is that uh, how much infrastructure emissions you're committed to depends on when you built the stuff. So in the US, we have a lot of uh, Hoover Dam air infrastructure, and we have some new infrastructure. In a country like China, it's pretty much all new. And so if you look at the committed emissions from existing infrastructure in China, here in the, the light purple, you can see that uh, because all their infrastructure is new, it, it doesn't get retired very fast, and we end up with a, a huge cumulative emissions going forward. Uh, in the US, which is in the, the light blue here, you can see that we have mostly old infrastructure. And so the committed emissions from the infrastructure we have goes away relatively rapidly. I, I think that this figure of how much emissions we're committed to now is, is extremely sobering and provides 
a really important picture of the amount of climate change that we can't avoid. Uh, if we look at the climate consequences of, of the uh, committed emissions, uh, we're looking at uh, CO2 concentrations that with the middle estimate rise to around 420 parts per million and global temperatures that rise to on the order of 1.3 to 1.4. Uh, the good news is that we're not yet committed to climate change above this level, uh, but the bad news is that every time we put new infrastructure in place that's going to persist for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we're really locked in to utilizing that unless we're willing to pay the exceptional costs of early retirement. Uh, finally, from this uh, Davis et al. paper, here's a plot of, uh, of where the committed emissions are coming from in the top figure on a country by country basis and in the bottom picture, figure uh, in a per capita basis. And, and the important contrast you can see here is that the US and, and China are the highest committed emissions countries on a country by country basis. But if you look at it on a per capita basis, the fact that, that on a per capita basis, the, the US still has five times the current emission of China uh, really jumps out. It, it's also important to recognize that when we develop technologies for adapting to climate change, those often have a very long time scale and a long planning horizon. This is the, the Thames River barrier outside London. It was designed in order to protect London from um, very rare and unusual extreme high tide or flood events. Uh, it's, it's actually deployed with a much higher frequency than the design frequency in order to um, accommodate the combination of sea level rise and unusual uh, tide events. And, and it illustrates kind of the, the scale and the complexity and the inertia of the technology for adaptation. And I, I want to close with, with uh, some comments about the, the pace of the, of the human responses. You know, th there are a lot of reasons that we might want to delay making investments in responding to climate change. Uh, we could avoid unnecessary expenditures, or we could um, sort of nurture technology in a non-emergency way, or as, uh, as Bjorn Lomberg argues, we could, we could start from a position of greater wealth and kind of let the system uh, fix itself. And uh, this the philosophy that we might benefit from delays was explored in a really interesting economic modeling approach uh, by, by Wigley et al. in a paper in Nature about 15 years ago now. And they said, well, what are the uh, consequences of uh, moving away from a business as usual scenario to trajectories that stabilize CO2 at, at different levels? And then they ran those through an economic model and said, and, and if we tried to optimize the system in terms of the economy, uh, would we deviate from business as usual immediately or, or would we wait? And what they concluded was that if you wanted to optimize economically, what you would do is uh, stay with business as usual emissions for a longer period and then deviate uh, but deploy uh, emissions reductions technology even more aggressively than the IPCC uh, stabilization scenarios in order to um, allow these technologies time to mature. One thing that Wigley et al. didn't really discuss very much, though, is what are the implications of delay? I mean, does, it, does delay mean uh, sit back and, and do nothing? Or does delay mean aggressively invest in uh, creating a level playing field, making sure R&D is in place, and establishing the infrastructure that's necessary for scale? And, and I think that the uh, misleading part of this is that uh, delay doesn't mean do nothing. It has to mean get prepared to make aggressive investments as the uh, technology becomes ripe. There's a, 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 an extremely interesting set of uh, recent models that, that I think drive this point home. You know, we can think about um, at least three, three ways we might uh, deploy resources to, to mitigate climate change. Uh, one is we could get a, a global agreement and we could have all countries buy in and, and, uh, and initiate immediately. Uh, we could have delays in participation or we could have uh, regional differentiation in who participates in, a, in a, some kind of a protocol to control emissions. And the Energy Modeling Forum, which is basically the consortium of all the world's uh, integrated assessment models that explore the consequences of this, 
published a paper recently comparing the uh, full participation, uh, delayed participation, and, and partial participation approaches to CO2 control. And, and what they found is that if you're trying to stabilize at 650 uh, parts per million equivalent, uh, pretty much all the models can, can do it independent of whether there are uh, delays or partial participation. If you go to 550, a somewhat higher standard, but one that still represents a, a doubling of current atmosphere, uh, pre-industrial atmospheric CO2, what you find is that uh, a bunch of the models say there's no solution. So where there's a black X here means that um, they, if you either overshoot or if you have uh, uh, delayed participation, uh, the models simply say that the economy can't, can't tolerate the shock that's associated with this rapid transition this requires. And then for 450 CO2 equivalent, a, a standard that many people think might be about as high as we want to go to be protective of the climate system and the world's ecosystems, uh, a shockingly large fraction of the models uh, don't reach a solution. And that's essentially uh, true for almost all the models if there's a, if there's a delay in implementation. The clear, mo uh, the clear message from these economic models is that if we want to be aggressive about the targets that we strive to hit, uh, we need to somehow figure out a way to uh, get full participation in the, in the exceedingly near term. Now, um, Ralph mentioned the important paper of Pakala and Sokolo, where in 2004 they said, you know, we, we pretty much have the technologies we need to solve the climate problem. And, and they presented the argument that, well, what we need, really need to do is work on deployment, but it's not, a, but it's not an emergency situation. And I think the, the important point that I want to uh, communicate is that the, the fact that we have the technologies doesn't mean we have the solutions. Deploying technologies that increase efficiency, conservation, and bring renewables online is almost exclusively a question of scale and not of whether we have the new technologies. And building up to the scales that are required is something that requires tremendous investments. And it requires dealing with the inertia that's built into the, uh, into the global human and economic systems. Ralph already presented a, a few numbers on the size of the challenge. And I, I want to emphasize those. Uh, the, the current global energy use is around uh, 15 terawatts. And uh, if we think about a global economy that's growing at something like 3% per year, and kind of a, a minimal number required to let people, especially in the world's developing regions, um, achieve the kind of lifestyles that they have every legitimate right to aspire to, uh, then we're talking about increasing global energy generation uh, by something like 3% of 15 terawatts or 450 uh, gigawatts. A, a big new power plant is typically around a gigawatt. So uh, even in the current situation, if the global energy system is going to grow at that rate, we're looking at something like developing the equivalent of one new power plant per day. The thing we need to think about is whether that's going to be a CO2 emitting power plant or an alternative. Um, one of the pieces of good news is that in the past, we've been able to increase the efficiency with which energy was used by about 1.5% per year. That means if we want to um, see a 3% a increase in um, the goods and services that come from energy use, we might do that with uh, only 1.5% or maybe, maybe even a smaller number of the uh, increase in energy. But that still means we're looking at having technologies at the global scale to deploy a big new power plant on the order of every other day. So let me just sort of conclude with the way I, I see the climate system and the pace of climate change working out. I mean, we can, we can think of the world as being characterized by um, some kind of cumulative climate change impacts. Uh, we may, in the future, be able to define a threshold of dangerous anthropogenic interference, or we may have a much more differentiated view that, that acknowledges that there are going to be some places that are at risk and others that are much less at risk. But there's some uh, level of desired impacts that we're comfortable with. And, and the real challenge is, is how to act on that. Um, it takes us some time in order to recognize that the climate's changing. Uh, I've argued that we've known it's, it's changing with a, a sufficient level of confidence to make smart decisions for some time. Um, 
we're talking about global agreements being important. It's very challenging to develop global agreements. It takes additional time. Uh, need for new technologies, for efficiency, for carbon capture and sequestration, for renewables. Developing those takes time. Scaling them takes time. Um, diffusing them to areas, especially areas that don't have very large amounts of economic resources, takes time. And then we have to deal with the fact that uh, there's a tremendous amount of inertia in the land and ocean system. So we end up with some kind of impacts that are uh, potentially a, a big multiple of where we wanted to be initially, and with a large uncertainty due to the fact that we don't really have that good a characterization of the, um, of the inertia in the land and ocean systems. Hey, 25 years ago, uh, Gary Larson said, we, we sort of know what we need to do. Oh, we're just not smart enough to deal with it. And in 2010, uh, Patrick Chapat said <laughs> that, that uh, we don't need to deal with it because uh, we're, we're being told that climate change is a, is a hoax. And, and I think at this point, there is an increasing scientific recognition of the value of early action, but there is important um, foot dragging being introduced into the system uh, by the casting of doubt. And I think that the uh, explanation of the, the strategies and the consequences is brilliant laid out, brilliantly laid out in, in Naomi Ruski's new book called Merchants of Doubt. I, I uh, recommend that to everyone. But I, I'm going to close with, um, with just a few brief thoughts. You know, when we think about climate changes in the future, an important new piece of the landscape is the recognition that the climate changes are as far as we can tell uh, essentially permanent. And climate change persists for many decades and that we're not only thinking about our children and their children, but their children and their grandchildren. Uh, the, the second thing that's really important is that when we talk about climate change, we're talking about altering risk profiles and that there's no short-term prospect that we're going to have 100% uh, confidence in the value of climate sensitivity. There's no short-term prospect that we're going to have 100% confidence in where we'll actually end up with a century of warming. But I would argue that we have sufficient information to start making good decisions, and increasingly what those good decisions um, are going to entail is making uh, short-term changes in um, the way we think about energy and the way we think about lifestyles in order to uh, deal with the time paces. That uh, over the last year or so, there's been a, a tremendous amount of controversy over climate change, but I think that it's largely been artificial and it's largely been manufactured exactly to produce delays that um, in the long run are the things that have the highest cost. Uh, we lose time and opportunity. Uh, we let the risks and damages accumulate. Uh, we don't get to take advantage of the co-benefits, and we, we don't get to take advantage of the leadership opportunity that, becomes, that comes from uh, being an early, the uh, early technology leader. So I want to uh, close with a uh, cartoon that, that was uh, published in USA Today during, uh, during the uh, Copenhagen summit last year. And, and um, the, well, you get the message. It, 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 the, the things that we should be doing to make smart decisions about climate change uh, don't need to be devastating. They don't need to be uh, damaging to the, to the world system. What they need to be is smart. And what we need to be doing is looking at a wide range of technologies for mitigation, for carbon capture and storage, for efficiency, and for conservation that um, take advantage of what we know and position us to manage the risk profile that we understand increasingly well. I want to close now, but I want to uh, thank uh, five individuals. Uh, Carolyn Snyder is a graduate student who did the work on climate sensitivity from paleo records. Um, Bill Anderegg is a graduate student uh, working with me and Steve Schneider, who has been studying sudden asthma decline and characterizing the temperature sensitivity of that. Uh, Scott Lowry is a postdoc who's worked on the velocity of climate change. And Ken Caldera is my colleague at Carnegie who's worked on uh, the papers on the permanence of climate change and the emissions commitments from existing infrastructure. And finally, my uh, very close colleague, Steve Schneider, who uh, tragically died in July, was uh, the world's earliest and I think most consistent and persuasive voice uh, 
about uh, climate change as a risk and a voice for helping people understand that we already know enough about the risk to start making the kinds of smart decisions that I hope we'll hear about in the symposium over the next two days. Thanks very much. Thank you.